My name is Tristan Vanwell. I manage Spray Creek Ranch in Northern Statlium Territory near Lillooet, BC. We are a diversified organic livestock operation, direct marketing beef, pork, lamb, and poultry throughout the Sea to Sky region. Charlie Lasser, first and foremost, is a legend. I have wanted to visit Lasser Ranch since I first heard Charlie sharing decades of wisdom and experience at an organic conference years ago. Somehow, he was able to get away from the ranch and attend those events, despite living a thousand kilometers away from Organic BC's headquarters in Vernon, and the fact that he was showing up for those events into his late 80s. I finally had the chance to visit Charlie, now 92 years young, thanks to this virtual Organic BC Field Day, and soaking up Charlie's lifetime of experience on the land was an amazing opportunity. Charlie Lasser comes from a long line of Swiss ranchers and has been farming for more than twice as long as I've been in existence. He moved the family dairy from Pitt Meadows up to Chetwind in the early 1970s. The town was formerly known as Little Prairie, but folks have a different definition of little up in the South Peace region. Lasser Ranch runs about 900 head of cattle on over 5,000 acres of the broad valley and hills just outside Chetwind. BC certified organic through the Pacific Agricultural Certification Society, Charlie is a pioneer and leader in the organic community and continues to learn, dream, and innovate his practices. Lasser Ranch cattle are rotated through 45 individual pastures that are divided with permanent fences. These paddocks range from 10 to 200 acres, and the herds are rotated every one to two weeks, depending on the time of year and condition of the forage. The crew puts up hay for winter feed each year, and uses hay to supplement grazing of stockpiled forages throughout the winter. In productive years, extra feed is put up in the form of silage in a couple of large silage pits. This silage will last in good condition for many years and acts as a bank account for savings from the good years that can be withdrawn if drought conditions impact the region. Most of the Lasser yearlings are sold on to Edgar Smith of Beaver Meadows Farm on Vancouver Island. Edgar finishes the cattle and markets them directly as well as through specialty stores and restaurants. Lasser Ranch has run a nearly closed herd operation for 50 years and has never brought heifers or cows into the operation since Charlie bought his initial herd of 40 Hereford, Angus, and Angus cross cows. He brings in new genetics as virgin bulls and has used Angus, Limousine, and Simmental cross bulls over the years. Careful selection and selling culls has built up a high quality breeding herd that is well adapted to that land. My name is Charlie Lasser, and I have what I call Lasser Ranches. I have been doing this all my life. You've said that uh, you've been doing things different here. Do you have a, a term or a word that you, what do you call your style of ranch? Well, I call it going back a couple hundred years ago where my uh, ancestors came to Switzerland. There was no fertilizer or nothing. They could grow good crops, uh, and they just utilized uh, what they had and built the soil up. If you build your soil up, eventually you'll get returns from it. Mm -hmm. But too many people today try to farm and they want instant result. Mm -hmm. And you can't get instant result. You'll go broke. I save, I would say between fertilizer and sprays, 50 to $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And that's our profit. Eliminating something that's not necessary, building the fertility in a different way. That's right. Managing your pests and disease problems by having that diversity, having great genetics in the herd, mowing the pastures down before the weeds have a chance to get seed. That's right. And you don't need any of that other stuff. That's the whole idea, yeah. exactly, yes. Yeah. And then use it, we're making always smaller pastures, smaller pastures so that I get far better utilization that way. One thing that would be good is if I could get you to run through what I was calling the cattle year again. If you could start at calving time with when that is yeah. and when it ends, and then talk us through when you're calving, when you're rotationally grazing, when you turn in the bulls roughly, and then and then when you come onto that stockpile grazing, you're done cutting hay. You just talk us through what does a year out there look like for the cattle, including when you shipping them. Okay, all right. We start calving on the uh, about the tenth of uh, April, and we calve till the 
uh, we've taken the bulls off this year so that uh, the last calving will be in the end of June. Okay, so that's the calving. Uh, the bulls go out on the uh, 10th of July. They're out breeding. We pull them. Yeah, we pull them at the end of September. So that gets the right sequence. They're on pasture. Then sometimes if they get mixed up yearlings with that, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, in December, we try to go till the 1st of December or preferably about the 10th of December anyhow without feeding any hay. And then we feed then right around, usually about the 1st of April, the grass is enough to be able to start turning out again. Along with the coal cows, you market the, the two-year-olds. What season are you shipping those cattle? Well, we have been shipping all the coal cows go, and some of the uh, yearlings, the bigger ones, will go in December. And then we have been shipping to uh, the island in springtime, but I think we're going to be talking with Edgar about shipping a little bit later so we get more of the growth again. But Edgar, he's, uh, I've never worked with anybody as pleasing and nice as him. We look at the price uh, so that both of us can make a dollar. That's the big thing. You can't have a winner and a loser. You've got to work for both. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. There's probably not that many places where you could ship your cattle to and get a backhaul of seaweed. No, there's not. <laughs> You're shipping cattle down to Edgar, hauling the seaweed back. We just haul so many bales back maybe every other year. And could you tell us a bit about how you got into the seaweed program? I'm curious uh, for you to explain the both the impacts we expect, impacts that you're actually seeing, and then just maybe the methods as well of how you're feeding it. Okay, what well, we try to feed for the young stock, we don't feed it to the cows, but we feed it to the young stock. And the year that we fed, they were actually about uh, from 100 to 150 pounds heavier that next to you with the seaweed because a cow has methane gas and it breathes out the methane. But the methane itself has a lot of good value in it. The seaweed eliminates the methane and then the good parts stay in the cow or in the animal and the animal will gain more weight. How, how are you feeding it? Uh, we have uh, like uh, feeders just uh, about uh, so wide and about six, eight foot long. We have a bunch of them. So a person takes it out and feeds it. Not only does that, but the animals are far more tame. Okay. Because they come up and they'll lick you and everything just to get your attention, you see. It's a win-win situation. So they like that seaweed. Oh God, they do. They go crazy over it. <laughs> That's great. It comes baled up yeah. so you can take kind of a flake of it like a bale of hay would. Yeah, we do. And then we break it all up okay. so that it's fine. Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. John Church. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Natural Resources at Thompson Rivers University. I'm also the BC Regional Innovation Chair in Cattle Industry Sustainability. You might have heard that cattle produce methane. It is true. Produce the methane from enteric fermentation, which means they burp it out the mouth. It's about 400 liters a day. Uh, the problem is, is a methane is a greenhouse gas at least 25 times more powerful than CO2 and it's accumulating at a faster rate. And the challenge is, even if we could solve transportation or energy production, the methane from the world's ruminants, the, right now there's about 1.5 billion, the methane that they produce alone can likely crash us. So I was fortunate enough to meet Edgar Smith and his partner, Charlie Lasser, and I looked at their beef. They're taking a novel approach. They're, they are grass finishing uh, their beef and I, it's organic but they're also using seaweed and there's a lot of excitement around seaweed there's one species that they're studying in California Asparagopsis taxiformis they're seeing an 80% uh, reduction in methane which is absolutely phenomenal uh, the Dutch have a chemical 3NOP 
and they're only looking at somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. So there's a lot of excitement. Now we're, we were using a species that, that's an invasive, Mazella japonica on the coast, and we didn't necessarily see that level of, of drop in, in methane production, but I looked at 160 different separate sources of grass-fed beef, organic beef, uh, grain-finished beef, and the beef produced from Charlie Lasser's ranch had some of the highest levels of omega-3 that I've ever recorded. Just prior to the pandemic, we had done this incredible study uh, with Edgar Smith and, and Charlie Lasser, and they sent the, the seaweed all the way up to Charlie Lasser's ranch in, in Fort St. John, as well as where the animals were being finished in Courtney in, in Vancouver Island. And I think it was a, a huge success. Now there is precedence, of course, for feeding seaweed. Uh, Japanese uh, producers, beef producers, have been using it as, as a component of their rations to produce Wagyu beef for, for many generations. And even in Scotland, you know, uh, farmers there would, would bring their animals down onto the beaches and they would graze on seaweed. I'm very excited about some of the benefits of potentially marrying the cultivation of seaweed in the ocean and then ultimately feeding that to cows. And you know, really the math works. If we could get the right strain of seaweed that would be easy to grow, all you really need is some boats and you can seed a long rope and it's very easy to harvest. So I'm very, very excited about the potential. The, the math actually works, that we could scale that up. And the, the side benefits is it'll lower the ocean's temperature and it's also very good. Seaweed's very efficient at pulling carbonic acid out of the ocean. Uh, they're much more efficient than land plants. So I'm really, really uh, excited about the possibility. You know, we could help the coral reefs and all of the, the, the shellfish and the mollusks at the same time, you know, healing the ocean. And then rather than simply sending all that seaweed to the bottom of the ocean and sequestering it, if we could use it uh, as a novel feed additive or supplement for cows and we could reduce the methane, it's a win-win-win all around. For, for not just for the producers, but also for the climate and the planet. Every field that I have, every pasture has access to good water. Mm -hmm. You've built countless ponds and developed springs and put in dams and you've got good water even in through two very dry years. Well, you have good water in these ponds all throughout the farm, even as we've seen some places out there where, where the streams have actually dried up. Yes, that is right, exactly. I understand that there that TRU is doing some research around the seaweed as well. John Church was looking at it? or Yes, yeah, Dr. Church, uh, uh, he went in Vancouver Island and he went to over 160 stores and he took samples and then he scientifically check those samples, but this was before the seaweed. The highest value was from this valley here right. that he could find uh, in all of BC. For the nutritional value of the grass-fed beef. That's or right. The, or the beef, yeah, the be Yeah, right. we had omega-3 and omega-6, which most didn't have. Right. But it's a lot to do with your cattle. I don't know if you'd get the same results with uh, just any cattle because we've kept the same cow. We've never bought a heifer or a, a, a cow in in 65 years. I think that might have something to do with it sure. too. Yeah. Sure. You've got some efficient cattle in the herd. Do you have some advice for people, for new producers, for other farmers on persisting when they're seeing problems or things they're trying aren't working out or they're facing these kinds of challenges? Okay, you go ahead, you got a problem. So you look at it, you come up with an idea and it doesn't work. That doesn't mean that's, that's a loss. That's part of a success because now you've got one less thing to worry about. <laughs> you know, that won't work. So you try the next one. And by the time you try your third one, you've got an answer. Mm -hmm. Don't get discouraged because it, uh, it doesn't work immediately. That goes for life itself. And the most impressive thing to me, getting to tour all around your ranch with you and hear all these stories and the history, the most impressive thing to me is that you're still trying new things, still 
have all the plans, you, you never stop working, you never stop trying new things, you never stop developing, and you have the next 25 years of your work laid out out there for you that you've already got all planned out. <laughs> so I'm impressed by that. Well, you see, uh, when I was young, I figured I'd work till 100. I was a, a, hundred, a 91 on June the 3rd. I'm in my 92nd year. But I always figured to go to 100 years working mm -hmm. and then retire and travel and enjoy life. <laughs> and you're going to need the time because I, I saw the number of projects that you have oh, underway, God. planned, and ongoing. So you're going to need the next eight, nine years at least. So don't, don't retire yet. The important thing is in life that you help other people. People don't realize some of these things I've been on, the reason I'm on there is to help. I was for 16 years on the Municipal Finance Authority that we borrowed all the money for all the municipalities and cities and everything in BC except Vancouver. But that was to help give people lower taxes. If you can do that, then you've done your job.